for Channel 4 News. Universal condemnation, an IRA apology and the Anglo-Irish agreement under pressure. Hello, good evening. It stunned even those hardened by terrorist atrocity. It united the House of Commons in outrage and grief. It even late this afternoon drew a faltering apology from the IRA, an apology whose only eloquence was as a commentary on the political consequences the assassin's fear may follow. Tonight we examine the reverberations of the Enniskillen bomb, which killed 11 people at a Remembrance Day service. We ask a former Irish cabinet minister what effect it may have in Dublin, where they've been hesitating about ratifying Europe's anti-terrorist convention. Here, the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland gives his reaction to the IRA statement and puts a question mark over Sinn Féin being allowed to stay in the democratic process. But first, the IRA finally admits it planted the Enniskillen bomb which killed 11 people and injured 60 more. But it says it regrets the catastrophic consequences. It claims the bomb was aimed at the security forces, but it went off without being triggered. Earlier, the president of Sinn Féin, Gerry Adams, moved to distance the IRA's political wing from the killings. He said, I do not try to justify yesterday's bombing. I regret very much that it happened. In the Commons, the Northern Ireland Secretary, Tom King, declares he will hold urgent talks with Irish ministers. He tells MPs there can be no sitting on the fence over full support for the security forces. Those who are not with us, he says, are against us. But Mr King's common statement did little to soften the anger of some Unionist MPs. But there was a more positive call from the leader of the mainly Catholic SDLP. Instead of a war of words from the dispatch box and press releases from Stormont Castle, will the Secretary of State now wage total all-out war against the provisional IRA? But there was a more positive call from the leader of the mainly Catholic SDLP. And the first lesson that we have to learn if we're going to live together is that we need each other and we're only going to discover how we need each other and how we're going to live together when we sit down to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Tonight, the Dublin government directed the new Irish police chief, Eamon Doherty, to seek an immediate meeting with the RUC's chief constable, Sir John Herman, to coordinate security on both sides of the border. From Enniskillen, and Perkins assesses the consequences of the disaster. Daybreak in Enniskillen, a town which had prided itself on its spirit of community, woke to the aftermath of the worst sectarian outrage for five years. As the security forces began the laborious search for evidence, some shops stayed closed. Tomorrow, the whole town will shut for the first of the 11 funerals. Then somebody squeezed my hand, and Mary said, Dad, is that you? Couldn't believe it. The most devastating account of the bombing has come from Gordon Wilson, whose daughter was fatally injured. How are you, Dad? I said, I'm fine. Dad, let's get out of here. I said, my dear, we can't get out of here. We're going to have to be taken from here. I'm pinned down, and so are you. But somebody will come. Give it time. Breathe quietly. Somebody will come. Don't worry, Mary. Then she screamed. And I said, are you all right? She said, yes. Are you sure? Yes. She screamed again. After three or four times, she assured me she was all right. She screamed every time. The fifth time I asked her, she said, Daddy, I love you very much. Those were the last words she spoke, to my knowledge. I prayed for the bombers last night, that God would forgive them. I bear them no ill will. At Enniskillen's hospital, five people are still critically ill, another 16 detained. An appeal fund has been set up in response to international expressions of sympathy. Really, they have been anxious to make some form of gesture of support. And in that respect, uh, uh, the churches have come together here in order to set up a special appeal fund. Now, uh, it will probably be used uh, in order to support uh, the victims of the uh, the, uh, the bombing, but uh, I would expect that the trustees will probably eventually agree to put up some sort of memorial for it as well. 
Raymond McCartney, who had taken a video camera to film the wreath laying, this morning watched the pictures he'd filmed instead. In a small community like Enniskillen, where everybody knows everybody, we have lost a lot of friends. And all I can say is the people of Enniskillen didn't want this. As the bulldozers moved in to demolish the bombed building, once a community centre, that sentiment was echoed by everyone, and Eskillon is equally divided between Catholic and Protestant. For Manor District Council here in Eskillon reflects the sectarian divide and the tradition of extreme republicanism in the borders. Sinn Féin, with eight seats, has the chairmanship of the council. Until now, the councillors had maintained a precarious harmony, but as the Sinn Féin members arrived this afternoon, refusing to add to expressions of regret made last night, it was clear that harmony was at an end. We're fed, up, we're fed up condemning this. Let's see them, let's see the guilty men come down those steps and answer your questions. The whole world wants to see that, not what official unionists think. Well, they're asking us to ask you the question, what do you think about the explosion? Well, I've already given you an interview yesterday. Then beyond that, he'd say nothing. Enniskillen is a microcosm of Irish history. It was once the fiefdom of the Maguires, the kings of Fermanagh. They first built the castle. The Republicans draw their support from that tradition, and out in the country, extremist Republicans have twice elected provisional IRA men. But at the end of the 16th century, Elizabeth I sent Captain Cole to colonize the town. His monument still dominates it. The planters who followed in his wake left neat, wide streets of square, solid houses. Until yesterday, the town center was to have been a conservation area, and until yesterday, Enniskillen was proud of its non-sectarian community. But in a border town, security is inevitable. For some time now, I think that we have felt that security was easing somewhat. Uh, this was, I believe, to be welcomed. Uh, indeed, uh, I have talked to the police about the possibility of maybe easing the situation in the town centre here. And uh, whilst they have their own reasons for maintaining a high level of security, I suppose now in, the, in relation to this incident, we have uh, we are a step back. One Protestant newspaper said this morning that the Anglo-Irish agreement was buried in this rubble. The official unionists here doubt it. We were promised in the Anglo-Irish agreement improved security. Uh, there were huge concessions made from a unionist point of view on the political dimension uh, in order to, to achieve that. And quite simply, that has not been delivered. 103 weeks after the agreement, that is still the case. There is no improved security. The SDLP is fighting to strengthen its political foothold here, but today they refuse to talk politics. And I remember that those people whom I knew well, I would refer to them as our people, because I'm a native of the town, a native of the county, and these people I knew well to find that they went to a religious ceremony yesterday morning and were murdered. It's repulsive. And the only thing I can say that's good about it, if there's anything good about it, is that at every future commemoration service at that cenotaph, there'd be 11 people, when all the other names are forgotten about, who will always be remembered. Despite the bomb, most people here do have faith in the town's future. They believe the community will be drawn together by the sectarian violence. And Perkins, ITN, in Eskillen. The official unionist MP, Ken McGuinness, whose constituency includes Enniskillen, today criticised the Anglo-Irish agreement, calling it an abdication of responsibility by the government. The agreement between the British government and Dublin was signed two years ago. But unionists want the government to reject it, saying it hasn't helped security and it's designed to force them into a united Ireland. The government has so far resisted that pressure, but now there may be a question mark over the agreement's future. When Margaret Thatcher and Garrett Fitzgerald signed the agreement at Hillsborough two years ago, they were trying to do two things. To lay the foundation for the long-term political stabilisation of Northern Ireland and to establish a more effective united front against the terrorists of the IRA. The problem was and is that if the security alliance was ineffective, then political cooperation was certain to come under strain. The agreement contained a major concession by the South it affirmed that any change in the status of Northern Ireland would come about only with the consent of a majority of the people of Northern Ireland. 
In return, the South was promised input on major legislation and policy issues via a standing conference drawn from ministers on both sides and a permanent secretariat to handle conference business. That was enough to inflame Unionists in the North, who embarked on a long and bitter campaign to protest against the agreement. After Enniskillen, the unprecedented involvement of the South in the affairs of the North, the nub of the agreement, has become much harder for them to stomach. Mrs Thatcher must first and foremost make sure that there is adequate security. She must stop relying on the cooperation of the Irish Republic. We see that the Irish Republic are not good neighbours, let alone people who will cooperate in security. If we get any help from them, let that be a bonus, but let it not be the basis for security in my constituency. The responsibility lies with her and her army and her police force. I am saying to the people of Northern Ireland that the time has now come when we must seriously consider taking the law into our own hands and resisting the terrorists. That because if we, don't, if we don't do that, then we all be dead men. I was there last night. I was in the hospital. I've had members of my own congregation butchered. I sat and held the hands of a young boy who's seriously injured and both his parents are in the grave. Now don't tell me to tell that young boy, be dignified, don't do anything. On the all-important security issue, there has been progress, apparently. Both sides speak of improved collaboration, both sides of the border. And police reaction to the major loyalist marches, in particular their willingness to stop or reroute them from flashpoint areas, has been the most tangible sign so far to the Catholic community that the agreement is more than words. In addition, since 1985, an RUC code of conduct has been drafted but not published, Supergrass trials have stopped and legislation on fairer employment practices has been promised. It's these benefits the minority community in the North want safeguarded. Two years on, for Irish Premier Charles Hockey, the touchstone of the good faith of the British government is whether they'll change the non-jury Diplock courts. They now sit with one judge, the Irish want three. And he's hinted that until the courts are changed, he won't ratify a new extradition treaty the British government badly needs, due to be signed three weeks from now. There may now be more pressure on him to sign. If he doesn't, the Anglo-Irish agreement could have a shaky future. Well, to discuss the future of the Anglo-Irish agreement, we're joined from Dublin by the deputy leader of the Labour Party in Ireland, Barry Desmond. He was a member of Dr Fitzgerald's coalition government, which signed the deal with Westminster. Mr Desmond, do you expect any adjustments to be made to the agreement or how it's run after this bombing? No, I, I'm enormously heartened by the fact that Tom King will be meeting his counterpart in the Republic here and that already further arrangements have been made for yet another meeting between the Garda Commissioner and the Chief Constable in Northern Ireland to discuss uh, the intensification of security measures uh, north and south. That is now obviously very necessary and I'm pleased that that, that basic response uh, is taking place. Will Mr King find Irish ministers any more receptive to ratifying this extradition treaty, the European Convention on the Suppression of Terrorism? I think he will find that uh, within the Irish Parliament, at government level and indeed in the opposition, that there is a determination to bring the mass IRA murderers uh, to trial, be it in Northern Ireland or indeed if they seek a haven uh, in the Republic, we will I implement uh, and enact the extradition treaty arrangements that we have. We have an extradition act in this country, 1965. We have a Criminal Law Jurisdiction Act, 1976. And the legislation is there. And it will be further underlined, I would hope, uh, by the enactment of the uh, European Convention uh, on the Suppression of Terrorism. I'm quite hopeful that the door will... Uh, go ahead now and uh, agree to the commencement date of the 1st of December. As you know, the Act has already been passed. All that's at issue now is the date of commencement. But you think that events at Enniskillim will have made the enactment of the legislation that much more likely? I would think so, and I think that I've no doubt that this IRA mass murder, and I, I repudiate and reject absolutely uh, the hypocrisy of Jerry Adams this evening, in his so-called explanation. It's a murderous explanation. I've no doubt it will determine, it will strengthen the 
basic determination of the Irish government and the whole of the Irish Parliament to stick by the Anglo-Irish Agreement. And as John Hume said uh, in Parliament in the UK today, we need each other. And I've no doubt, whatever, that um, the extradition uh, convention will underline that joint cooperation. Oh. And there is a great deal of cooperation there at the moment. And will the convention be ratified without preconditions? I would hope so. And my recommendation on a personal basis to my party uh, would be that we should so enact on the 1st of December, because I was a member of the government that put it to the ball, and as you know, we got it through on the casting vote of the Speaker at the time, and I think we should go ahead uh, and enact the, the, the convention without further ado. If there were now moves at Westminster to ban Sinn Féin or com compel Sinn Féin candidates in elections to take some sort of loyalty oath, would that be within the spirit of the Anglo-Irish Agreement? How do well, you think that Doyle would react to that? Well, certainly it would be within the spirit of what we do in the Republic. We at least have the basic political hygiene of not allowing a terrorist like Jerry Adams uh, on or, for example, on BBC or ITN. We, we, we don't allow the, the, the likes of that person. Uh, that odious individual onto our national airwaves in the Republic. But they are allowed to stand for election. <laughs> they, they, they are, but I can assure you that they get very short shift from the electorate down here. They, they, they can hardly get together 2% of the electorate. And he's elected from Northern Ireland uh, to the UK Parliament. And that's a matter of a very sobering reflection that the real problem lies very much within Northern Ireland and uh, within the kind of outrageous mass murders that he and his colleagues are perpetrating uh, allegedly in the name of democracy, but that's so hollow now and so sickening that one could hardly use that word in, in reference to him. Barry Desmond, thank you very much for talking to thank us. Thank you indeed. The Deputy Leader of the Irish Labour Party. Well, in the House of Commons, the Northern Ireland Secretary Tom King strongly defended the Anglo-Irish Agreement. The atmosphere in the House reflected the deep sense of outrage felt by all members. A number of Unionist members of Parliament attacked the government for not doing more to help the people of Northern Ireland. The time for platitudes was over, some said, and they called for action against terrorists. After his statement, I asked the Northern Ireland Secretary for his reaction to the IRA's admission that they were behind the bomb attack. Well, I think it's the most contemptible statement I've ever seen. It's taken them all this time to cobble this together. I suppose what they're saying is, they didn't mean to kill these people, they meant to kill other people instead. Uh, it's utterly disgraceful, it's utterly untrue, uh, and it's a pathetic attempt to transfer the blame for a, an outrage which the whole world has condemned. Of course, it makes sense too, doesn't it, as an admission that they have gone too far this time and that they fear the consequences. Well, if they were thinking that instead of killing people's, perhaps parents, they should have killed the members of the Girl Guides and the Boys Brigade who might have been in the uh, parade as well as other members of the security forces, I think it beggars description. I mean, if they were thinking of setting it off at a different time, there might have been three times as many people there if it had gone off on the later occasion. Fact is, I said it last night, uh, that uh, anybody who knew anything about that parade knew that the spectators would be standing by that building and that with a certainty, if that explosion went off as it did, uh, that those, the bystanders, the spectators, would be the people who would be killed. But do you think the IRA and the... Uh political mouthpiece, the Sinn Féin, are right to fear the political consequences of this act? I think it's absolutely correct. I think it's totally counterproductive. You can see the way in which, in the House of Commons today, the Parliament really spoke with one very clear voice, that I think particularly on such a solemn day as Remembrance Day, which a ceremony shared right across the country, people have been deeply shocked, and in that sense, it's brought people together. There's deep warmth of feeling for people in Northern Ireland at this outrage, and it's only stiffened people's determination to finally rid the province of this appalling ter uh, terrorism. You were also urged in the House of Commons to question, begin to question Sinn Féin's legitimacy as participants in the democratic process. Have you that in mind? Well, I've already just issued uh, a consultation paper about the whole situation of people uh, who support violence taking part in the democratic process. Uh, the old uh, complaint about the armor light and the ballot box, that democracy can't exist with violence as its ally. And uh, I've made very clear the government's position on that, and it's a situation we're not prepared to allow to continue. When you say that, do you mean there is now a real prospect of Sinn Féin being outlawed? I have uh, canvassed a number of alternatives. Uh, prescription is one of the issues that is described, although that does have difficulties. 
but certainly we cannot have people in councils uh, who actually support the men of violence and do it openly in the way they do. Is it conceivable now that the Irish Republic does not ratify the European Convention on the Suppression of Terrorism? Well, that's a matter for the Irish government and a matter for the Irish Parliament. But I've made absolutely clear the importance that we attach to this. I think it is enormously important that all the countries of Europe stand together now in fighting this evil that uh, uh, affects us all in one way or another. But if they still hesitated to ratify the Convention, what would your reaction be? Well, I very much hope that uh, it will go forward. I've made that quite clear, uh, and that remains my position. If they're talking of a quid pro quo, are you sympathetic to that? We've been working together now for two years. I hope that cooperation will continue. Uh, I'm sure there are benefits, uh, particularly in the security field, that can flow from it. I'm very anxious to see that continue. But given their reluctance to ratify, and the recent uh, evidence of ineptitude in the uh, the Irish police in the hunt for their most wanted man. Are they really up to the war against terrorism? They've been called in the House of Commons not good neighbours by Mr McGuinness. Well, they face a different problem. Uh, they are largely an unarmed police force. Uh, the atrocities and the crimes of the IRA have been very much committed in Northern Ireland, uh, and uh, they haven't had to face them in quite the same way. They're very careful not to commit crimes in the South if they can possibly avoid it. But they, in the long run, will be as big a threat to the Republic of Ireland as they are to us. And they're an extremist group uh, determined to seize power in the whole of the island of Ireland. And that's why we've got to work together. And that's why, with whatever the resources are, we've got to make the best use of them and make sure that the cooperation is as effective as we can make it. But you didn't quite answer the question. Do you think the Irish themselves have the heart and the means to beat terrorism? Well, you didn't quite say that question, I think. But, that was what uh, the question <laughs> clearly implied. Uh, but what I said was we make the best use of the resources. I'm absolutely convinced of their commitment. Yes, it's true that they haven't had the years of hard going that we have had in the North in which the IUC, the security forces, have developed very considerable expertise, have had enormous resources at their disposal. It hasn't been the same in the Republic, but we shall give them the help we can, and I'm absolutely convinced of their determination to make the best use of the experience and the resources that they have. When the agreement was signed, the greatest expectations on the British side were that it could deliver on security, yet the level of violence has increased. Hasn't the time come as the agreement itself allows to review the whole working of the conference and what you've all been up to? I think you've got to ask yourself one simple question. Do you think we're more likely to make progress in this fight against terrorism if we work in cooperation with the Irish government, with their goodwills, their active support, uh, or whether we somehow stand aside uh, and had some sort of uh, isolation between us. I, having tackled this problem now over the last two years, and having expressed my impatience that we can't always go as fast as I would like, nonetheless do believe that it must be by cooperation that we have the best hope of defeating terrorism, and cooperation also on a much wider international scale. The United States, we've had the support only recently of the French government as well with the seizure of the arms shipment. It's international cooperation that we need and close cooperation with the Republic of Ireland. You seem to put more store on cooperating with the Republic of Ireland than you do with the Unionists who feel left out of the process, who, well, we have Mr Paisley today saying we must seriously consider taking the law into our own hands. No, I've made absolutely clear that I would like to see much closer cooperation with the Unionists. They know very well my door is open. Uh, and I said in the House today, people who said I didn't listen uh, to suggestions that they made, uh, that they have only to come and talk to me uh, and to put forward suggestions they have. If they're good suggestions, I shall be delighted to see how we can incorporate them and develop and improve our security approach. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Late this afternoon, the Prime Minister met the Fermanagh MP, Ken McGuinness, but rejected his demand to bring back internment. And with the province facing implacable unionist opposition to the Anglo-Irish agreement, politicians can't agree on the next move. A few moments ago, our political correspondent David Walter talked to representatives of both communities. He asked John Hume of the mainly Catholic SDLP and Peter Robinson, former deputy leader of the Democratic Unionist Party, whether Mr King's statement helped them out of the impasse. Secretary of State's comments in the House this afternoon uh, will be a severe setback to the unionist community in Northern Ireland. 
who were distressed and disillusioned as a result of the Enniskillen tragedy. They were waiting for some word of hope from the Secretary of State. They got none at all. The Secretary of State didn't announce any new initiative on the security front. And there are clearly many things that the security forces could do. But underlying any security policy must be the will to defeat terrorism, the will to win. And the present policy isn't based upon that premise. It is based upon the premise of compromising to constitutional nationalists in order to wean away the supporters of the IRA towards the constitutional nationalist political parties. Uh, and therefore, the Anglo-Irish agreement itself being one of the many compromises that have been made uh, indicate to me that they are still on that policy of uh, offering SOPs to nationalists in order to try and uh, attract their support away from the IRA. It doesn't work. Enniskillen proved it doesn't work. It was buried under the rubble in the Enniskillen town on uh, Sunday and unfortunately it will be buried in many other places over the next number of weeks, months and years in Northern Ireland. But one consequence is that it could bring an extradition treaty with the Republic closer, couldn't it? That must be a good thing. Well, uh, I'm afraid that uh, I don't share your optimism. Uh, an extradition treaty with the Irish Republic will still be based upon the uh, will of the government of the Irish Republic. I have no confidence that the government of the Irish Republic would operate an extradition treaty to the advantage of the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm pretty sure that someone who was uh, instrumental uh, in assisting in spawning the IRA is not going to go out of his way to attempt to defeat the IRA. I would hope that the resolve that uh, emerged yesterday, the common resolve that emerged yesterday from the statement of both Mrs Thatcher, who said that there should be no hiding place anywhere in these islands, and Mr Hahi, who said that everything possible should be done to make sure that the people who committed that crime are brought to justice. That resolve will go stronger in the days, of, uh, days ahead, that common resolve, and that any differences that may remain uh, will be, will be uh, resolved. Would you accept that yesterday's incident has strengthened the Unionist case against the Anglo-Irish Agreement? No, I don't at all, because I don't know any better way of dealing with events like yesterday, or indeed dealing with the underlying problem that gave rise to them, than the two governments involved using all the resources and working together to deal with it. I see no better way of doing it. And those who think that it's not a good way, could I hear, please, what their alternative way is? The IRA have now admitted responsibility, but said it was a mistake, that it was intended for the security forces, but was triggered accidentally uh, ahead of time. How will that statement go down in Northern Ireland, do you think? Well, I think that what happened yesterday, as I said, it, it was, first of all, to decide to plant a bomb when people are commemorating the dead of two world wars. And the dead of two world wars, people died in both world wars who come from every section of every community in both islands. To even contemplate interfering with that is offensive to everyone, uh, and deeply offensive. And of course, would be seen as deeply provocative to the Unionist people in particular. And I would hope that the Unionist people would see that and would not engage in any way in the retaliation.